Uh, well, our speaker tonight is John Williams. He's coming to us from his 100-acre estate in uh, Travis County and uh, outside of Austin. Uh, John is a first-time author, but a long-time um, lawyer and wildlife habitat biologist. He has, he's from Oklahoma. He has a master's in botany from the University of Oklahoma. And then he came to Texas in 1973. He got his law degree from UT. He worked as a wildlife habitat biologist for, biologist for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and an environmental lawyer for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. He's retired recently, as I said, to his, um, he says 100 acres of post oak, blackjack, red cedar forest in Eastern Travis County, and he raises fainting goats. And I've heard of them before, and they're a real breed of goats, and you can ask him about that. He says this is his first book. He got interested as, you know, studying biology and plants in uh, Frederick Lindenhe Lindheimer, and, couldn't find anybody, couldn't find an English translation of his collected essays from the 1800s when he was, uh, Lindheimer was the editor of a newspaper in New Braunfels. Lindheimer is a German immigrant and he wrote in German. And so John, he said he waited 47 years for somebody to translate these collected essays and they didn't, so he said he had to do it himself. And that was quite a challenge because they were printed in an old German script. I think he's going to discuss some of his adventures with translating too. So he says he has, this is his first book. It's published by Texas A&M University Press. So that's where you can go to get it, I assume, or John can tell you if it's, if it's available elsewhere, Amazon and places. He says he has two other works in planning and drafting and one more in the concept. So he's really getting into the author business and all of them will concern plants. So with that, we'll turn it over to John Williams, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here tonight. Uh, let me give you a, a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about tonight. First of all, I'm going to talk about the translation and some of the uh, problems I had with the translation and try to answer the question why nobody else has uh, uh, translated this before now. Uh, most of all, I want to get into the things I learned about Lindheimer from translating this, this book. Uh, in particular, I want to talk about uh, things that Lindheimer observed about the vegetation of Texas during his lifetime in Texas. He lived here for 43 years from 1836 to 1879. I want to talk about Lindheimer's humor, his vast knowledge of uh, uh, Greek and Roman culture, literature, German history, German literature, and German philosophy. I want to share with you a, 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 an interesting uh, tidbit about uh, Lindheimer and ecosystems. I want to share with you some of Lindheimer's best writing, and then I want to tell you how my impression of Lindheimer totally changed when I translated this book. As Libby said, I have been waiting 47 years for someone else, anyone else, to translate this book, and no one has done it. Uh, I wanted, you know, I, I knew that Lindheimer was the father of Texas botany when I came to Texas. <clears throat> and I, and he, I learned that he had written this book uh, based on essays that he printed in his own newspaper and that he had uh, sent off to other newspapers around the country. And I wanted to know what Lindheimer was like in his own words. But 47 years ago, my knowledge of German was Serschlecht, that means very poor or literally very bad. And I waited and waited and no one translated it. I, if, as I encountered people that were raised in Germany or Austria or German speaking Switzerland, I would try to persuade them to help me translate it and no one picked up on it. Uh, so 10 years ago when I retired, I set myself the task of learning enough German to at least be able to read the German and uh, attempt a tra translation. Um, in January 2018, I uh, cleared my desk, brought my uh, uh, dictionaries up to the forefront, made certain all my internet connections and bookmarks were working. And I said to myself, let's see how difficult this can be. And six months later, I had enough of a, of a uh, um, 
manuscript to interest Texas A&M University. It has taken them two years to get it to press, but at least it's available. And if you haven't seen it yet, this is the book. All right, now, why hasn't anyone else translated this before now? Well, uh, it's not because the, the essays are in German, because a lot of people know German. Uh, there is a, 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 a problem that you have to overcome before you get to the translation. Let me show you what that means. This is, uh, okay. I'm assuming you can see this on the screen sharing. This is the title page of Lindheimer's book. And let's see, come on. Let me get my uh, spotlight ready. Can everybody see the title page and see the red dot? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The title page, uh, the title of Lindheimer's book in German is Aufsätze und Abhandlungen von Ferdinand Lindheimer in Texas with the subtitle uh, Herr Ausgegeben von einem seiner Schüler. Now, as you can see from this title page, it's in a very peculiar style of type. It's called Fraktur. And if you grew up in Germany and native German, you're probably used to seeing it. But if, you, if not, then there are several pairs of confusing letters. For instance, the first word, Aufsetze, the third letter right above my dot is an F. But the next letter next to it is what typologists refer to as a long S. And as you can see, the only difference is between the two, they're virtually identical except the F has a crossbar and the S doesn't. Uh, remember that movable type when uh, 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 setting plates of type for printing, uh, each letter of type wears down after a lot of use. And the thinner lines wear down faster than the thicker lines. Also, uh, at least in Lindheimer's day when he was printing his newspaper, every plate had to be hand uh, uh, inked. Uh, and if you didn't get the uh, ink spread across evenly, there were places where it was thicker and would uh, bleed from one letter into the next, and places where it was, uh, the ink was thin, it just wouldn't show all the thin lines. The middle word, und, U-N-D, means and. And the first letter is a U, and the second letter is an N. U as in Utah, N as in Nevada. And I'm deliberately not blowing this up for you because uh, the body type of the book uh, is not blown up, and it's very difficult to distinguish between the U and the N. You have to know what it is you're looking at, and you need to try one and then the other. Also, uh, in the last word, Abhandlungen, the B and the H are very similar, and if there's too much ink on an H, it closes off at the bottom and looks just like a B. Uh, so it's, you know, these things, Proctor is very difficult to read if you're not used to it. Now imagine if you were a, uh, a, a German immigrant in New Braunfels back in the 18, 1900s, and you had problems with your uh, vision and you went to an eye doctor and the eye doctor would set up this, a eye chart, a say proben tafel. Uh, in front of you and say, read the first line. And if you were a good German and been uh, exposed to the culture and knew your Fraktur letters, you could say the first letter is the, the letter E, capital letter E. Uh, and let's see, I stopped sharing. Let me do this again. I was going for the, uh, where did it go now? There we go. Um, come on. Okay, this first letter is a capital E as an echo. The middle letter is a capital C as in Charlie. 
And the last letter is a capital G as in Google. Now, this is pretty large type. So you can see the difference in, differences in them when you blow them up. And there were some times I was having to use a magnifying glass just to distinguish one letter from another. The second line, the first letter is a capital B. Anyone want to guess what the second letter is next to it? It's a capital V as in Victor. There's very little difference as you can tell. Third line, there's a capital R and the letter right next to it is a capital N. Almost indistinguishable. And as these letters start getting smaller and smaller, it's diff more and more difficult to tell them apart. The fourth line I threw in just because it's a crazy letter, doesn't look like anything that it's equivalent to in the um, English or Roman alphabet. That's a small letter K, if you can believe it. Up here in the top line, just above my red pointer in the word fractor, you can see the K looks just like the letter T, except it has little Christmas ornaments hanging from the top. Um, the next line, H is quite distinguishable, but right next to it looks very similar, except it has a shorter uh, upward uh, bar on the left. That's the letter Y. And that's the first thing that I had to do was transcribe Linheimer's entire book <clears throat> from Fraktur into type that I could read. Um, Linheimer's life. He was born in 1801 in Frankfurt am Main. He was the youngest of four siblings, all boys. Uh, the Lindheimer family had, was known very well in Frankfurt. Long line of civic leaders, several uh, city council members, and an occasional mayor. But Lindheimer's father died when he was very young, and his oldest brother, who was already an adult by this time, uh, became the head of the family. Lindheimer was educated at a gymnasium. It's a high school in Frankfurt. He attended a preparatory school in Berlin, and then three universities, the universities of, uh, University of Wiesbaden, University of Jena, and the University of Bonn. Now, this is very common in Germany in the 19th century. It's the equivalent today of our college uh, freshmen, sophomores, and even juniors changing their majors every semester until they find one that's compatible with them. Uh, there is no degree known for Lindheimer uh, or, uh, you know, either earned or conferred. One source I saw uh, claimed to have seen a transcript of his coursework at the University of Bonn, and it was very heavy on Greek and Roman culture, German history, German literature, and philosophy. By, the, by his 20s, by the uh, late 1820s, Lindheimer was a teacher in a private school in Frankfurt, the Bunsen Institute. And in 1833, there was a student insurrection in Frankfurt, not just from Lindheimer School, but from all of the schools around Frankfurt. The students seized City Hall and they ousted the mayor and the city council members. They immediately extended the right to vote to women and men who did not own property, which was shocking and they started spending public money on uh, 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 public health initiatives around town. Nevertheless, Hessian troops moved into the city, restored order, jailed most of the students, and then they turned to look at the teachers who were teaching them, teaching them these radical ideas. At least seven teachers at uh, Lindheimer School were forced into exile, including the school's founder and owner. Uh, out of work, uh, Lindheimer came to America as well as the, as the others, other teachers. There are no records of any charges brought against Lindheimer, no records of even an investigation against Lindheimer. Uh, years and years later, his Lin, uh, Ferdinand Lindheimer's oldest son uh, implied that there was family uh, 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 disputes, family uh, discord over Lindheimer's alleged or uh, actual uh, participation in the student insurrection. By the middle of 1834, Lindheimer and seven others are living uh, in a German community near the town of Belleville, east of St. Louis, just across the river from St. Louis, on the farm of George Engelmann's uncle, 
George Engelman, who was a friend of Lindheimer from his years at, at Bonn, University of Bonn. In the fall of 1834, Lindheimer and others moved down the, the river to New Orleans, intending to go to Texas. But the overland route was too dangerous, so they decided to go by ship to Veracruz, intending to go to Mexico City by way of the safer route uh, from, from the south into Texas. But they never made it to Mexico City. Instead, they spent 18 months at a German colony growing sugarcane some miles inland from Veracruz in a region Lindheimer describes as the Terra Templada, the land of eternal spring. By early 1836, news of the Texas Revolution um, was being printed in the newspapers, and Lindheimer tried to get to Texas in time, uh, but his, his ship uh, was uh, ran aground off the coast of uh, Alabama, uh, and Lindheimer joined a group of Alabama volunteers trying to get to uh, Texas in time to help with the revolution, but they arrived one day late. Uh, Lindheimer there, thereafter served 18 months in the Texas Army, took his pay in the form of land near a German community near the town of Industry, northwest of Houston, but he couldn't make par farming pay. No indication of why he couldn't. Uh, there's speculation, but you know, I, I won't go into it. During this time, Lindheimer also returned several times to visit his friend Engelman in St. Louis, who had set up a medical practice there. And they got the idea for Lindheimer to collect Texas plants that then could be sold in Europe and throughout the Eastern United States to subscribers um, for money. Uh, they enlisted uh, Asa Gray, the, the foremost uh, authority on American, on, on botany in the United States. Gray solicited subscriptions, got as many as 50, would send the money to Engelman, and Engelman would forward the money to Lindheimer. Um, Lindheimer proceeded to bail hay because he had to collect a lot of each species for a complete set of his, his specimens to be distributed to the subscribers. During the second collecting season, Lindheimer uh, encountered Prince Soames, of a group called the Mainzer Adelsverein, which was a group of noble, noblemen in Germany who were trying to establish German colonies for a future German empire. And they had this idea of establishing a German colony in Texas. Um, he accompanied the uh, first settlers from Indianola where, uh, where their ship uh, docked to their supposedly temporary headquarters in New Braunfels. Uh, most of the settlers loved New Braunfels, who wouldn't? It's a beautiful place. And Lindheimer was delighted with the plants that he saw around New Braunfels and uh, just asked to join the colony. He was granted that, he got a town lot in New Braunfels, he married and had children. During this period, uh, Lindheimer started uh, collecting, are you gonna come up? There we go. Started collecting plants that are very common in Texas, this is agarita, that were new to science based on Lindheimer's collections. This is Engelmania, uh, used to be called Engelmania penitifida, it's got a new specific name now. Um, Let's see, where is... These are species that were first collected by Lindheimer, never before been seen uh, to science. That was Lindheimer texana. Uh, this is a... Lindheimer's uh, scrofy pea. Uh, named for him, and let's see if some more. There's, I got a bunch of pictures here of flowers that... Ah, Lindheimer was the first one to collect the uh, uh, Indian blanket or fire wheels. Uh, snow on the prairie. 
based on the Nimer collection. Ah, and Texas Mountain Laurel. And this is uh, Gara Lenheimeri, or now it's Enothera Lenheimeri, um, Lenheimer's lizard tail. Um, during the eight years that uh, Lenheimer was collecting plants around New Braunfels, uh, his collecting trips were taking him away from I think I mentioned he married and started having children. His collecting trips were taking him away from his family for three, six, and sometimes nine months at a time. And he decided he needed a means of employment that didn't take him away from his family. After all, his oldest son was starting to reach school age and Lindheimer wanted to participate in that. In 1850, in the census of the United States, 1850, it turns out that, that uh, New Braunfels was the fourth largest city in Texas after San Antonio, Houston, Austin, and, and then New Braunfels. And the Meinzer Autosverein that ran things in the city of New Braunfels had purchased a printing press and hired an editor for a newspaper, but the first editor didn't, didn't work out and they had to let him go. So they called a public meeting uh, to ask the citizens of New Braunfels, you know, what do we do? Who, who, do we who do we call upon to be editor of our newspaper? And somebody suggested Lindheimer. Lindheimer accepted. And he started uh, printing the Lind Neu Braunfelser Zeitung uh, on November 12th, 1852. This is this is the the masthead of his newspaper. First line says Neu Braunfelser Zeitung, ein Organ der Deutschen Verwolkerung von West Texas. That's ein Organ. It just means a voice, a a a, a means of voice for the German colonists of West Texas. Herr Ausgegeben, edited von Werner Lindheimer. This is not number one. This is not the first issue. This was the second issue that came a week later on November 19th. I'll show you why I'm not showing you the first issue. Uh, newsprint is, is quite, uh, all right, where are you? I know I've, well, I'll have to. Newsprint is, uh, Uh, come on, open. Anyway, it's damaged. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 first issue, the the only copy known uh, online or even at the museums, uh, the archives of the newspaper in New Braunfels, uh, is very damaged, and it's not much to look at. Um, it, Lindheimer was editor of the newspaper for 20 years. He started publishing essays in his own newspaper with the very first issue. Um, and the very first uh, essay he published was the first one that's in the book, uh, The Bald Cypress of Western Texas. He retired about 1872, and one of his students from back in the days when he was teaching in Frankfurt, a man a medical surgeon named Gustav Passava helped Lindheimer put together this collection of essays that was published in early 1879. Lindheimer died shortly thereafter. He was described as, one moment. He was quiet and deliberate in manner, temperate and regular in his habits, and a good conversationalist. Now, who wouldn't want that said about them after we've passed? But I wanna get back to this point at the very, very end when I tell you about how my conception of Lindheimer totally changed. Um, I wanna emphasize that, that Lindheimer is considered the father of Texas botany, not 
not because he was the first person to collect Texas plants for uh, scientific evaluation. In the third chapter in his book, he lists those who collected plants before him. There was Jean Berlandier, the Frenchman who worked working for a Swiss botanist, uh, Augustin Pyramu de Candol. There was uh, Thomas Drummond, the Scotsman, working for the British botanist um, um, W.J. Hooker. There was a surgeon from New Orleans, John Riddell, who traveled up the uh, Trinity River from its mouth to as far as Dallas and Fort Worth. And there was um, uh, Army surgeon Malines Conklin Leavenworth, after whom Fort Leavenworth, Kansas is named, who was a um, veteran of the Seminole Wars, but had an interest in botany. <clears throat> was stationed briefly in central uh, Louisiana and uh, could, uh, made occasional excursions across the Sabine River into Texas collecting plants. But none of those four people, uh, that makes Lindheimer the fifth by his own count person to collect Texas plants for scientific evaluation. We know now that there was a sixth and I'll talk about him in a moment. But none of those that preceded Lindheimer stayed very long. Lindheimer lived here. He collected for eight years or more. And his collection was sent to subscribers all over Europe and all over the Eastern United States. People were talking about Lindheimer in Europe and the quality of his collections. Um, and Lindheimer's collections helped dispel a misconception that most European botanists and American botanists had about the flora of Texas. And I'll, let me explain what that misconception was. It begins in 1522 when uh, Cortez conquered uh, Mexico. And are you gonna expand? It's not gonna enlarge for me, sorry. Uh, this mountain is called Pico de Orizaba. It's about 60 miles inland to the west of the port of Veracruz. On a clear day, uh, and I assume that in 1522 there were more clear days than there are now, uh, you can see its summit uh, two or three days before you get to uh, the coastline of Mexico. It's like a sentinel raising its head above the, uh, the uh, horizon of the ocean. This is a picture in summertime. It's, uh, I mean, in the wintertime, and as you see lots of snow, in the summertime it all melts, except for a very small glacier at the very uh, top of the mountain. Uh, it's the third highest peak in North America, over 18,000 feet, and it is sitting at 19 degrees north latitude, which is at least four and a half degrees south of the Tropic of Cancer, well within the, within the tropical zone. In fact, the climate at Veracruz is oppressively tropical, but this has snow. Um, Cortez never climbed this mountain. But the reason you can see uh, snow on it is that just below the, uh, what you see where there's snow is the tree line. And above tree line is a plant community known as alpine meadows. I learned it as alpine tundra. And alpine meadows are ex as exciting to botanists as isolated tropical islands in the South Pacific because on isolated tropical islands, speciation occurs quite rapidly and most everything you find is a new species. The same thing happens on in alpine meadows, especially when mountains are isolated from each other because the habitat below tree line is as alien to the plants that grow in alpine meadows as the ocean is to plants growing on tropical islands. It's either too hot or it's too dry or too wet. 
Uh, the next thing that uh, in the misconception of, Ameri of American and European botanists, and I'm getting problems now with my screen sharing. Come on. Zoom meetings is not responding. Wait for the program to respond. All right. As soon as I can show it. Uh, the next thing that happened was a, um, a book that was published in uh, Philadelphia in 1822. The title of the book was uh, Account of an Expedition from Pittsburgh to the Rocky Mountains under the leadership of Major Stephen H. Long uh, in 1820 and 1821. Come on, let's share. Um, it was written by a man named Edwin James who was the expedition's surgeon and botanist. They were sent out to <clears throat> discover the sources of the river, of the Platte River, the Arkansas River, and the Red River, because everybody assumed that the Red River uh, originated in the Rocky Mountains because it was such a big river. Uh, are you all hearing me? Because uh, I'm seeing nothing but frozen screens. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, then uh, I'll keep talking. One of the things they discovered. Uh, in central Colorado was a mountain that uh, was initially intended to be named James's Peak because Edwin James climbed it with two other uh, party. And, uh, but a per certain person named Zebulon Pike had more political influence. So today we know it as Pike's Peak. It is not as big as, as tall as the Pico de Orizaba only 14,000 feet, but it too has a tree line and an extensive area of alpine meadow. Lying further to the north, the tree line is further down on the slopes, and so it has a comparable area of alpine meadow. James climbed it in July of 1821, and let me read what he says about it. On the morning of the 14th, we continued the ascent, hoping to be able to reach the summit of the peak and return to the same camp in the evening. A little above the point where the timber disappears entirely commences a region of astonishing beauty, covered with a carpet of low but brilliantly flowering alpine plants. We now found it would be impossible to reach the summit of the mountain and return to our camp of the preceding night during that part of the day which remained. But as we could not persuade ourselves to turn back, excuse me, to turn back, after having so nearly accomplished the ascent, we resolved to take our chance of spending the night on whatever part of the mountain it might overtake us. We met as we proceeded such numbers of unknown and interesting plants as to occasion much delay in collecting and were under the disagreeable necessity of passing by numbers, which we saw in situations of difficult access. Uh, James's book, The Account of the Expedition from Pittsburgh to the Rocky Mountains, was a bestseller, even though it was two volumes. And it sold so well that uh, they had to uh, authorize a, an, another printer in London to print editions for the European uh, market. Uh, James, in his, in his account, being a botanist, described and named all the new species he found on Pike's Peak. And this made botanists the world over just terribly jealous. They wanted some of the action. Now, how did these two things, the discovery of Pico de Orizaba and Pike's Peak, affect what people thought of Texas? Well, they're like 1,500 miles apart, but if you, t if you get an, at an atlas and you draw straight lines between the two peaks. The straight line passes west of San Antonio not very far. In fact, probably before you get to Del Rio, uh, going west from San Antonio, is, uh, is the straight line between Pikes Peak and Pico de Orizaba. Up north where you are, um, probably somewhere west, not very far west of Abilene, there should be, as European and Eastern American botanists thought, there should be mountains with you know snow on their caps and plenty of alpine tundra. 
Um, think about that next time you're driving west from, uh, from Weatherford toward uh, uh, Midland Odessa or whatever. Um, in fact, during the time that Lindheimer was collecting plants, uh, Asa Gray wrote to Engelman saying, tell Lindheimer to go west from San Antonio, get up into the mountains, because the only significant plants to come out of Texas will come from the Texas high country. Well, Lindheimer never sent any plants to Gray from the Texas high country. He just sent plants from the Texas hill country. And um, as we now know, the Texas hill country has a high degree of, their, of its own endemic species that grow nowhere else in the world. Uh, so Gray got plenty of time to, uh, plenty of chance to name new species from that. Uh, it wasn't until years later when there was uh, a survey of the U.S. and Mexican boundary and the railroad surveys for the transcontinental railroad at different latitudes did Gray realize there are no snow-capped peaks in Texas. Okay, things I learned about Lindheimer from uh, translating the book. Let's see if this can come up. Now, every time I try to move, it, I just get the circle. So I'll just read. Um, let's see. One of the things that, that struck me most was Lindheimer's observations of the changes that was happening in the vegetation of Texas during his lifetime. He was particularly worried about depleting the natural fertility of the soil. Let me read you. In Germany and in almost all of Europe, it is taken for granted that agriculture cannot be operated successfully without livestock kept in stables which supplies the necessary fertilizer. Here in America, and especially in Texas, one relies on the inexhaustibility of the virgin soil and on the labor required for stabling and fertilizing, while the numerous cattle herds seek their sustenance from the still undeveloped land itself. Up to 40 years ago, this, he's writing this in 1879, up to 40 years ago and even later, it was almost universally accepted that farmland in the United States needed no fertilizer. Eastern states, however, have already learned that many of their fields that once yielded a hundredfold crop now yield scarcely 20-fold and that some arable land, now mostly depleted of nutrients, is no longer worthwhile being cultivated and has to be left to forest growth that of a lean, soil-satisfied, and self-planted conifer, the old field pine of the Americans that we call today loblolly pine. Lindheimer stressed the point that you cannot plant the same crop on the same field year after year without robbing the soil of its nutrients. He described it as a system of robbery. Now, in contrast to that, Lindheimer held up the region of uh, Germany that grows grapes along the Rhine River, the Main River, the Neckar, and the Moselle. Uh, where is this? The vineyards planted on the Rhine by the, and in Hungary by the Roman Emperor uh, Probus as early as 276 AD can serve as a splendid example of the effect of careful cultivation and fertilization on virgin bearing capacity. Now, after 1600 years, they yield just as rich a grape harvest as in the time of Tacitus and the old German invasions of those regions. But with what careful care have these vineyards been cultivated? Every year, barges on the Main and Rhine transport manure to the vineyards of the Rheingau. These fertilizers are mixed with soil at compost heaps that, after careful pot preparation, is carried on the backs of vintners 
to the steep terraces and slopes of the vineyards. I have a picture, but I can't pull it up. Uh, these uh, vineyards along the uh, uh, Moselle and, and Rhine rivers that are practically at 45 degree angle. And after 1600 years in Lindenheimer's time, now it's 1700 years, going on 1800 years, the productivity of these vineyards is just as great as it was back in the third century AD because of composting and returning nutrients to the soil. So remember this, next time you're in your backyard and you have to turn over your compost file for next year's garden, sustainable agriculture does work. The second thing that Linheimer mentioned was the invasion of alien invasive plants. Just outside of New Braunfels, when New Braunfels was first uh, incorporated in 1845, there were fields on unclaimed land of what Lindemar called sugary beard grass, but the, the scientific name he used equates it to big blue stem, a tall grass prairie grass, a tall prairie grass. And Lindheimer says the sugary blue stem was so dense that the farmers in New Braunfels went out to these unclaimed fields and mowed it and belled it for their own livestock, effectively removing a crop from the fields and robbing the, the soil of its nutrients that would normally be recycled by the decay of the previous year's grass plants. Within just a few years, Lindheimer points out, there was no more sugary beard grass growing in these fields. It was nothing but cockle burrs, sand burrs, buffalo burrs, sunflowers, and hog crotons. And this is in the 1840s. I always had this concept in my mind that weeds, invasive aliens, were a 20th century thing. No, it got started within a few years of uh, German settlement or of, you know. Uh, moving on. I enjoyed Lindheimer's humor. Uh, I, I mentioned that when he was living in uh, Illinois in a cabin with seven others, he mentioned uh, the roof of our old log cabin was so patchy that we can make astronomical observations from our, from our beds. And then, uh, they go to New Orleans and they decide to take a boat to uh, Veracruz. Uh, now, in this passage I'm going to read to you now, there is a, uh, a particular word, Gaskin, uh, that Lindheimer uses. The German is equivalent is Gaskogner. And a Gaskin is a demonym. Uh, a demonym is the name of something or a person that from a particular geographical area. Texan is a demonym. American, Canadian, Mexican. Italian, German, Dane, Pole, Swede, uh, 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 Austinite, New Braunfelser, uh, Dallasite, whether you call people from Weatherford, Weatherfordians, um, it's a demonym. A Gascon is a name of a person from a historical region in southwestern France called Gascony. Uh, it no longer exists. It hasn't existed for a long time, but famous uh, Gascons include Eleanor of Aquitaine, the mother of uh, Richard the Lionhearted and King John of Magna Carta fame, uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, a real life person, and um, a, a bodyguard for the King of France, a real life person named D'Artagnan, who appears in a, some novels concerning the Three Musketeers. All right. Since I and my two traveling companions were particularly interested in Mexico with its tropical regions, we decided to sail from New Orleans to Mexico 
and then tried to make the journey through Mexico to Texas. We soon found a small schooner that was about to travel to Veracruz. The schooner's cargo consisted of American chairs and dried fish. For $60 per person, we took a so-called cabin pass passage on this small vessel. However, uh, passing that, as we arrived on board the small ship, we were astonished to find besides us three travelers, another four. There could be no question of a stay in the cabin for the passengers because it was barely big enough for the captain. Our lot was half a dozen miserable bunks in steerage between, between the chairs and dried fish. Our traveling party, not the chairs and dried fish, but that of an old Spanish colonel who had emigrated from Mexico upon its declaration of independence, and a lively swaggering Gascon who owned a plantation in Mexico was quite agreeable compared to the remaining company of two young French dandies who were heading straight to Mexico to make their fortune there. In addition, our captain was one of those disgusting Yankees who seemed to have little understanding even of his presumed trade, navigation. After a night of great extravagance for the captain, he arrived on his ship on the morning of departure, still half intoxicated and with burned hands with which he had fallen into a fireplace. Even before leaving the Mississippi, we had several accidents. First, we sideswiped another ship, and then we ran aground on a shoal with the front of our ship. As a result, the whole cargo was moved from the front to the back to get off the shallows. And during this operation, so inconvenient to the passengers, one of our sailors took the good opportunity to escape to the nearby shore and rid himself of the unpleasant captain. The crossing of the Gulf that was estimated to take four days lasted 11 days due to bad weather and the captain's ignorance. How inadequate his knowledge was could readily be seen for he made no observations and he did not even use the books found in his cabin. He had nothing to do with Meyer's moon tables. And when I talked to him about the American edition of logarithmic tables, he scornfully shoved them aside and opened a book with great satisfaction in which simple pictorial views of the coastline of the Gulf were represented and said, this is my Bible. On the first day of our Gulf cruise, a storm washed away all our stock of, the, of live poultry from the deck. The result was that we only got very bad fare from then on. We certainly would not have complained except that the Spanish colonel, an old man who deserved better food, and the Gascon remarked that the captain was eating better for himself than we did. The two of them therefore complained strongly to the captain who ran into his cabin with great anger and came back cursing and brandishing a saber in his shin. This Chinese bluster aroused general laughter and especially the derision of the Gascon. Full of rage, the Yankee yelled, your tongue is too long. Whereupon the Gascon replied, in Veracruz, your tongue will be too short. So they arrived in Veracruz, they, uh, 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 have their first impressions of the town. Um, but the story is not over yet. While we had satisfied our first curiosity in the ancient streets of Veracruz, our traveling companions, the Colonel and the Gascon, had brought a lawsuit against our ship's captain at the Alcalde. Our entire ship's company found itself together again in the courtroom. The complaint was made and the Colonel and the Gascon each gave a long vivid speech in Spanish in which they described their sufferings and the Yankees' arrogance against the passengers. This time, these two men appeared against the ship's captain in very surprising form. The colonel wore his colonel's uniforms, whose epaulets were studded with diamonds, and the Gascon wore a Mexican captain's uniform. The Yankee had become very meek by this time, and the Gascon remarked to him, is my tongue longer now? Due to his bad treatment of us and his poor hospitality, the captain was ordered to repay us half our passage fee. This happened immediately through the merchant house for which the schooner had carried cargo without any, inf without any formalities, without instruction, without assistance from constable or sheriff, but solely on our application at the house. Finally, there's a third example of Lynn Hammer's humor that I would like to 
point out to you. In his chapter on an overview of the floor of Texas, uh, Linheimer, uh, do I have my, nope, still certain. Uh, Linheimer is describing the plants of the, of the hill country to the west of, of New Braunfels. And he briefly describes a, a species of the genus Garia, G-A-R-R-Y-A, which we, a common name is silk tassel. Um, and Linheimer says, the Garia, which occurs here on the sl sloping sidewalls of ravines, is a very dark green, multi-stemmed shrub, four to five feet tall, of gloomy, melancholy appearance. Now, I know that if you're with the Native Plant Society, you have at least attempted to use a dichotomous key at some point in time. Um, and dichotomous keys, you know, plants so tall or plants shorter than this amount, uh, plants with ovate leaves, plants with lanceolate, le lanceolate leaves, quantifiable things that you can look up to see what ovate means and what lanceolate means and things like that. Can you imagine coming across a, a couplet in uh, uh, a dichotomous key <coughs> that goes, plants gloomy, plants not gloomy, or plants melancholy, plants not melancholy. And you wonder, what was he talking about? Well, just a few years before, Lynn, uh, a bot botanist at Columbia University, or Columbia College it was back then, um, named the, the silk tassel Garia Linheimeri after Linheimer himself. And I don't know if I'm, I'm frozen, I see everybody else is frozen, but if you look at, I have his picture on my graphics that I can't pull up, but if you can see the, the front cover of the book, the one of only two photographs of Lindheimer, he has a very gloomy, melancholy appearance. And that's, I think he was poking fun at himself. Um, now I'm coming, okay, I can make it. Um, as I pointed out, Lindheimer I had a, a great, took a lot of, of college courses in Greek and Roman culture, German history, literature, and philosophy. And he made allusions to uh, Greek and Roman culture and literature and German history that he assumed at least some of his readers would recognize and know and understand. Um, and he did a lot of quotations of poetry, uh, a lot of it from uh, the German poet Goethe, Wolfgang Goethe. And let's see. Uh, I was amazed that his uh, his uh, quotations were were very exact, and I thought, well, he had a copy of Goethe in front of him, but then I came upon one uh, quotation. He he quoted five stanzas of a poem from Goethe, and they were you know he, he just missed one word, but he quoted the first, second, third, fourth, and sixth stanzas from the poem. He skipped over the fifth, which he wouldn't have done if he had it in front of him. I think he was doing these quotations from poetry uh, in his book and his, his, his uh, references to Greek and Roman culture entirely from his mind, from his memory from when he was in college. And a couple of, of instances, let me point out. He quotes a poem from Goethe in uh, uh, a situation where he is trying to make the point that when you uh, live in the far north, you, you really crave tropical things like tropical fruits, bananas and pineapples and oranges, lemons. But he points out having lived in the tropics, when you live in the tropics, you crave fruits from the north, apples and, and pears and quinces and things like that. Uh, it's like you're not satisfied with uh, 
what you have and you want the exotic. And uh, Lindheimer quotes uh, a, a, a poem from, from Goethe. Um, Kennst du das Land, wo die Citrone blüht? Im dunklen Laub die gold Oranga glüht. And I translated that as, do you know the land where the lemon grows? In darkened leaves, the orange, the, the golden orange glows. Which is a pretty good citation of, of Goethe's poem, except that in the original, Goethe made orange and lemon plural. And in doing so, the rhyme at the end of the line changes. Uh, because the verb, he ends the lines with a verb. And so it, it, this, is, this is the original from, from Goethe. Kennst du das Land, wo die Citronen blühen? Im dunklen Laub die gold orangen glühen. Which I translate as, do you know the land where the lemons bloom? The golden oranges glow in the darkening gloom. Ein sanfter Wind und blauen Himmel weht, die Myrte still und hoch der Lober steht. A gentle wind blows from the deep blue sky, the myrtle stands still and the laurel stands high. Beautiful German. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is very personal. Uh, my wife and I have been married 48 years. My uh, Mother-in-law died about 15 years ago, so 48 minus 15 is 33. For 33 years, uh, uh, I've been around my mother-in-law. And when she was in college, she wanted most dearly to become a thespian. And a thespian is a, um, a person that is a stage actor, actress. And she remembered all these these things from, from when she was training to be a thespian. Now World War II intervened and then marriage and children and family. So she never finished her degree and never became a thespian. But for 33 years, um, we would be at dinner or we'd be driving someplace or be, be watching uh, TV or something. And all of a sudden my mother-in-law would burst forth in these entire soliloquies from Shakespeare or whole stanzas or poems from Longfellow or Tennyson. And it seemingly was out of nowhere. But one time when it happened, she looked at me and said, oh, well, something you said or Evelyn said or, or her husband or my father-in-law said just reminded me of something back in my mind. And when I remembered it, I just had to say it. And, you know, these things that are learned when you are young just come bursting forth. Um, when a and Press sent out my book for review, uh, one of the reviewers was an ecologist that has published several things with a and Press. And he made a point after reviewing it that just kind of blew me away. I, I noticed it when I was translating it. I thought it was a very interesting concept, but I didn't know the significance of it. Let me read you it. Uh, this uh, essay, I think, was written very close to the time uh, of, of the book being published in the 1870s. And Lindheimer, Lindheimer writes, the clear-sighted botanist, unlimited by his senses and impulses whilst using his imagination and thoughts, like morning dew and sunlight spread across the joyous vegetation of a country in order to understand the language of the beautiful mute children of flora can discern the character of the whole vegetation of a land and make clear the accord and character of the whole vegetation to which they belong in their homeland and the reviewer said lindheimer is describing the idea of ecosystem that you can name and conceptualize a tall grass prairie from just knowing that you have big blue stem, little blue stem, upland, panic grass, and, and yellow Indian grass. 
And the idea of ecosystem extends not just to the plants in the community, but to the plant animal interactions in the community and the whole idea of nutrient flows and energy flows through a community. And you may be thinking, okay, so Lindheimer is describing an ecosystem, which word wasn't invented until 1930, 50 years after Lindheimer wrote this. And even when it was introduced, it was so controversial, it took a decade or more before scientists uh, accepted the idea of ecosystem as a functioning unit with all these interactions and all these flows between individuals. And Lindheimer goes on and says, the botanist can do this just as anyone sitting in the great chapel of St. Petersburg where each organ pipe produces only one note, but all together form the most beautiful harmony based on only a few plants, a few notes can discern the whole chord. Um, one of my favorite passages is from the very first uh, essay in the book. Um, and it illustrates how Lindheimer can switch from purely expository uh, uh, descriptive uh, text to uh, commenting about the human condition and then go back. Just flip-flop back and forth. It was normal for Lindheimer. Among the trees of Western Texas, the bald cypress is the undisputed queen. The mightiest and most prominent species of trees in other parts of the country, such as the sycamore, the live oak, and the scarlet oak, do not achieve their fullest statue here. Thus, the bald cypress appears so much mightier. In the swamps of Louisiana, the home of alligators, thick-headed turtles, bullfrogs, and poisonous water snakes, the bald cypress rises as a forest of slender columns above the sinister dark surface of the water. In West Texas, where there are no swamps, it stands only in rows at the edge of clear flowing creeks and streams, but of greater stature and often pushed so close together that between two trunks, no third of equal size could fit. On the upper Guadalupe, on Spring Creek, on the Sabinal, on the Medina, bald cypresses often are found in long rows with trunks standing three to seven feet thick, each with a naked trunk reaching 60 to 80 feet. If a painter portrayed such a scene, you would call his image false and excessive. How can the roots of such densely standing trees find space? Not to mention sufficient food in the ground, one would say. The bald cypress seems more like a water plant. Groups of small and medium-sized bald cypresses often stand on rocky shoals or in the very fast flow of mountain streams, desperately clasping rocks with their branching roots and with conspicuous effort standing their ground with their weight upright against the mechanical laws of fluid dynamics. Just as here, organic nature triumphs over the laws of the inorganic, in the same way, the truly moral nature of man holds its own despite all the apparent contradictions of a baser world and life view, but also from a different, more somber perspective. Bald cypresses may represent a parable to us. The highest goal of perfection can hardly be achieved if the struggle for mere existence takes all strength. On the banks of the same river stand closed ranks of more advantaged trees entwined root within root. One tree strengthens another. The powerful roots together form a braided embankment against the washing waves and a dike against the country beyond from which sediments washed down by heavy rains is caught as if by the finest earthen dam. Thus unification ensures added stability and ample nourishment for each individual. Under such conditions, the bald cypress reaches its highest perfection as does man by analogy. And in such places occur bald cypresses from seven or more feet in diameter. Finally, I told you uh, that when Lindheimer died, he was described as having uh, uh, being a good conversationalist and regular in his habits and temperate in his, in his character. Um, when I started this translation, my impression of Lindheimer was as a quiet, unassuming, 
uh, collector of plants, mild-mannered, a harmless drudge. But throughout the book, the number of times that Lindheimer makes allusions to battles, heroes, swords, and other military uh, uh, accoutrements, it's obvious to me that Lindheimer saw himself as a bold, outspoken, sword-wielding warrior defending knowledge, skepticism, and freedom against ignorance, blind faith, and tyranny. As Lindheimer himself said in one of the most succinct sentences I translated, I mean to conquer the world through knowledge. That was Lindheimer, Ferdinand Lindheimer, the father of Texas botany. Hope you enjoy my book. That's it. One of the things that uh, uh, was the question was, what happened to uh, his family? Did his family continue to live with him there in uh, uh, New Braunfels or? Yeah, uh, uh, he had, he raised uh, two sons and two daughters to adulthood. There was a fifth child that died when he was young. Um, they, uh, there are some people that know where they are. I have not bothered to track them down. I just, just fo wanted to focus on Lindheimer's own words. Um, at the other side of, of the coin, I would point out that after he left Germany, he never communicated with anyone else in his family except his next oldest brother. And when his mother died some years later, he disavowed any uh, uh, claim to an inheritance from her estate. Uh, so there, there was some grounds for uh, believing the his, Ferdinand's eldest son saying there was family discord. Can you explain how um, he collected uh, his plants? Did he dig them up or did he uh, cut them? Or is it, was it similar uh, he, to I, what they do now? I'm certain uh, there's, uh, there's plenty of plants that I've, of specimens I've seen with roots on, but they're mostly annuals. Uh, he did have to use special techniques for cacti and woody plants. Uh, his, there's another book out uh, by, um, uh, at least can I remember her name? Uh, it's called A Life Among the Texas Flora. Uh, Minetta Altgelt Goyne, G-O-Y-N-E. She translated Lindheimer's letters to Engelman back in St. Louis. And his letters are constantly talking about the uh, acquiring ream after ream after ream of collecting papers, and then the wretched weather conditions he had to endure in drying them. Uh, so drying the plants once he collected them was a, a major uh, a deal for him. Also back in the 19th century, uh, people used to carry what was called a vasculum. It was like a, a tin lunch bag, round, uh, and it, you could seal it and you could put the plants in there and it would keep them fresh for most of a day before you got back to camp and then start pressing them all at once. Mm -hmm. Now someone had commented in here about that book by, uh, uh, that you mentioned, the one about uh, from Altgelt. Uh, Goyne, yeah, her last name is G-O-Y-N-E, Goyne. Goyne, yes. She, she was at North, I think she was at North Texas State University um, she was a professor of, of German. And how do we get your book? Is it uh, on Amazon? It's, uh, you can order it through Texas a and Press, uh, Amazon, or uh, uh, Barnes & Noble. Right. Uh, and what happened to uh, our, his specimens? Are any of them, is there any place that they can be seen now or? Um, they are? Yeah, the, the, his specimens ended up in institutions, herbariums all over Europe and Eastern United States. But as late as the middle of the 19th century, there were so many duplicates left. Um, they didn't make a, a complete set, but uh, state colleges like the University of Oklahoma, University of Texas, uh, most of the, uh, the uh, state colleges in the middle of the United States could ask the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden for a reasonably complete set of his specimens and th they would get them. They had enough leftover duplicates. 
Uh, but as for display, uh, they're not really out there for display. They're, they are museum artifacts. They're mounted on uh, 18 by 24 inch uh, herbarium sheets, glued uh, with label and collecting information. Uh, and they're dried. They're mostly yellow and brown. They're not that much to look at. Some of them retain their color. Uh, a lot of them don't. And somebody, uh, Lonnie Charles has commented that they, there are some specimens at Baylor. Probably are. I'm certain they are. Yeah. In the back of my book, I have a list of all the species I could find that were based on Lindheimer's collections. Uh, and it runs to, where is it? Where is the beginning of it? 373 scientific names based on Lindheimer collections that uh, translates to 198 accepted entities. That's genus, species, subspecies, or variety. Uh, plus another 41 that may or may not be distinct from the from the 198. Uh, so there's several hundred species that are based on the number of collections. Not all of them are named after him, but they are his collections. Uh, somebody wanted to know the difference between cypress and bald cypress. Ah, uh, well, bald cypress loses its needles. <laughs> cypress is evergreen. Um, also, I, um, they both have woody cones and bald cypress, it's a round cone. Uh, I, they used to be, uh, when I was taking botany as a, in my, from a master's degree, bald cypress was in a separate family from the cy true cypresses. And bald cypress and redwood and giant sequoia uh, are related. But now the you know the pendulum swings back and forth. Now uh, everybody seems to put those three, uh, the the uh, giant sequoia, redwoods, and, and bald cypress in the same family as the true cypresses. So we'll see. I ask that you uh, give us the information about your book again. Oh, uh, what? How to, how to acquire it or just uh, how I translated it, what? Uh, maybe just, uh, yeah, how you translated it and how you, uh, and yeah. okay. what the I, name is. I, I knew that Lindheimer was the father of Texas botany before I got to Texas 47 years ago. And when I found out that he had written a book, I just had to know what he said about himself. Uh, so I've been waiting 47 years for someone else, anyone else to translate it instead of me because 47 years ago, my German was very poor. And then when I retired 10 years ago, I set myself uh, uh, the task of learning enough German to uh, at least be able to read it and attempt a translation. And it turned out when uh, I sent the manuscript to A&M uh, and they reviewed it, uh, the reviewer that reviewed the German said it was a pretty good translation. So I'm happy about that. Um, I depended a lot on uh, a, an internet forum that I that came across uh, that consists of professional translators from German to English, German to French, German to Spanish, German to Italian, and various, various other uh, uh, languages. And I participated in the German English forum. And after I sort of established my credentials with them, uh, they were very helpful, especially tracking down rather obscure uh, quotations to Greek and Roman literature or obscure trans, uh, quotations of Goethe. They, they could look them up. But the worst one, <laughs> now th this is, Lindheimer's memory failed him on this one. Uh, he talked about uh, the, the passage of a great amount of, of geologic time and he made a comparison to the uh, the bird in a thousand and one Arabian nights that brings a single grain of sand to the holy mountain once every thousand years and that's how the mountain was built up well I tried to find any reference to any birds 
in a thousand and one nights that also referenced carrying a single grain of sand and it just does not exist. I had people in the forum searching uh, German translations of a thousand and one nights. Uh, uh, one person even did a search of the French translation of a thousand and one nights because it was originally uh, evidently the original translation and nobody could find it. Nobody could find it until finally somebody piped up and said, oh, well, there's this footnote in an annotated copy of uh, the Grimm brothers, not their fairy tales, but the Grimm brothers multi-volume uh, work on Nordic mythology. And in that footnote, it mentions a bird that carries a single grain of sand to the holy mountain uh, once every thousand years. And now it's a huge mountain and that's uh, in the indicative of the great pa passage of a great amount of time. So Lindheimer had read it probably because the Grimm brothers treatise on Nordic mythology was per certainly something he might have would have read. He just mixed it up with a thousand and one nights. I don't know why. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. This was a fascinating uh, presentation. Well, thank you for having me. I've uh, presented to the New Braunfels chapter last week. I think I've got uh, Dallas scheduled for the second week in November. Uh, and then two in next year <laughs> after January. Ah, and one other thing I can say is Lindheimer's book is full of comments about politics and religion which are two topics I, my grandmother used to always say, when you come to Thanksgiving or Christmas, no politics, no religion. And what with the, uh, our current political uh, uh, season coming upon us, I just decided I'll let you all read the book and find out yourself what Lindheimer's politics were and what his <laughs> religion were.